Good evening. Welcome to the Wednesday Evening Reflection. Bishop Ariel Santos here. Uh, once again, our desire is uh, <clears throat> to somehow make God known through the principles of His kingdom. We know the principles of the kingdom of God. We know the nature of its king. Today we look back to last Sunday's uh, readings, particularly the gospel. Last Sunday was the Feast of the Baptism of our Lord. You know, the, the natural question to ask is, why did Jesus have to be baptized when he was sinless? He was baptized by John, whose baptism was for repentance, for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is sinless. Why did he have to be baptized? In fact, Mark doesn't bother to explain to to go. Um, I mean, to elaborate this, but Matthew and Luke, uh, in their in their uh, narratives, they they took time to uh, include the the conversation of Jesus and John, the John's John's uh, John's protestation. And where, where, where he asked Jesus, why, why did he come to me for baptism? I should, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus tells him, well, per minute, for now, let us go through uh, all righteousness. And that's what he, he did. He did righteousness and justice, which are the foundation of his throne. And, and during that time, it was, it was the... It was Roman time. Culture was Roman. They, they were dominating. And, and the Jews were struggling to, uh, or trying hard to, to maintain their own kingdom culture. They, they're, they're people of God. They belong to the kingdom of God. Not supposed to be under any Gentile nation domination, but they're supposed to be the people of God. But the culture of the Romans, they first of all they they called their uh, their their emperors son sons of God. It started with a certain I think it was I forgot who Caesar Julius Caesar, but it started with him. He was deified uh, by the people. He, he was considered to be divine, considered to be a god. So when he passed away and uh, his son succeeded him. His son was called the Son of God before Jesus was called Son of God. Okay? They, that, that was, that was the, what happened. And they believed in what is called the augury. Augury is uh, like the reading of omens, particularly uh, of signs from from birds. If, if people see an eagle hovering over an emperor, say the emperor is in his palace, in his balcony, and then they see a, a, an eagle, which is the sign of Rome, right? Their eagle is in, on, their, in, uh, on their standards, on their banners, etc. It's a sign of power. They see a, a, an eagle hovering over an emperor, they would say, that's the seal of God. That's God saying, this is my beloved son. Remember that. That's, that's Roman culture, Roman belief. And Mark and the other gospel writers, they, uh, they reclaimed that title because it, rightfully belongs to Jesus. That's why Mark opens his gospel by saying, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. First, the word gospel, again taken from Roman, Roman culture. Gospel meant then the news that a herald coming from the battlefield, a herald brings into the capital of Rome, and the good news that he would give to them, to all the people, that Caesar and his generals 
once again won yet another battle. It's good news. And so Mark says, the true gospel is this. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the true Son of God. That's the true gospel. Because Jesus is the true King. So it's, it's a subversive message, right? But, but note that. Put your finger on that. Um, two things happen uh, at Jesus' baptism. One is that a, a bird, but not an eagle, but a dove, hovered over him and rested on his shoulder. And two, a voice was heard from heaven, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So, again, Mark is using that <clears throat> illustration to, to correct a wrong understanding of the people and to tell them that the kingdom of God in Christ is greater than the kingdom of Caesar. The power and pomp, and pomp of nations shall pass like a dream away, but the word of God, the plan of God, the kingdom of God, will never end. There will be no end to the increase of its government. So that's Mark's proclamation. But instead of an eagle, it's a dove that rested on Jesus' shoulders. Dove describing the nature of the kingdom of Jesus. It's a kingdom of peace, a kingdom of meekness and humility, as, of, as opposed to what the eagle represents, which is violence and, and domination and exploitation and the, the, the strong ruling over the weak and taking advantage over them. That's a very, very shaky uh, foundation. But the foundation of Jesus' throne is righteousness and justice and service of people. And then God saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Why was he pleased in Jesus? Because of what Jesus did. Let's go back to the, the question in the beginning. Why was Jesus baptized? He was sinless. Well, he was not baptized for his sins. He was baptized for the sins of the human race with whom he identified. <clears throat> so that now becoming man and being part of the, the whole body of humanity, he now can say, we have sinned. We have all sinned. Maybe I haven't as an individual, but I belong to the rest of the human race. I'm in solidarity with them. Their sin is my sin now. Their problem is my problem now. Their struggles are my struggles now. I own them. I don't disown my brothers. In fact, like Hebrew says, Jesus was not ashamed to call these sinful people, these unworthy people, to be his brothers. That's what pleases God. The Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, rested on Jesus' shoulder. Who is the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is also called paraclete. Paraclete means one who stands beside you to be your ally, to be your defender, to be your advocate. That's what a paraclete is. The opposite spirit of that is what the Jews called in the Old Testament, in their language, hasatan. Hasatan meaning accuser, one who points a finger, one who divides. That's the opposite of the Spirit of God Jesus was operating in and in which God was pleased. Sometimes, many times, we have the spirit of Hasatan, Satan, instead of the spirit of God, or at least we operate in uh, the spirit of Satan. 
even if the Spirit of God resides in us. And, and when we do that, we grieve the Holy Spirit. But, <clears throat> see, some, sometimes when, say, we belong to a group or a family or what have you, if we feel we are righteous and faultless, and the people we belong with, they, they fail, make a mistake, Sometimes the tendency is we don't want to be identified with them, right? Tendency is to leave and look for some other organization or body or family where we can uh, belong because we want to find something that is spotless, that is perfect. And so we... We, thinking that we're better than our culpable brothers, we leave them in the lurch and leave them in, our, in their own problem to, for them to solve it because I stand apart from self-concern. I'm not concerned about us. I'm concerned about me. Again, the opposite of Jesus. Not concerned about me and my convenience and my justification and my excuse in saying, I don't have a sin, I don't have to join you, sinful people. No. Joins them, owns their, their problems, and helps them. Instead of abandoning them and leaving them, staying with them, helping them, see, seeing the, their problems through. Like what Jesus promised he will be with us until the end of the age imagine the patience involved in that he is long suffering not willing for any to perish and i've always said this and I, I i've read this somewhere but a monk an orthodox monk saying about jesus that we can be assured that as long as there is some someone in hell Jesus will stay with them there until he has gotten them out. That's the spirit of Jesus. That's what pleases God. Standing in solidarity instead of standing apart. In the baptism of Jesus, Pharisees and scribes and other religious leaders, chief priests, they were also present, but not to be baptized. They were not in the water with the rest of their brothers. They were on the riverbank, standing, pointing a finger, saying, You are sinners. You need to, be, you need to repent. You need, need to be cleansed so that you can become like us. In the meantime, we will not join you. We don't want to be identified with you. We don't want to be associated with you because we're righteous. The one person... Who could say that? Jesus Christ. The only sinless person who could say that was Jesus. And yet, he did not say it. He did not do it. What he did was light came into darkness. Didn't say, I don't belong there. I am light. You know, why would I leave the bliss of heaven and the right hand of God to go into darkness? To do, go into muddy waters. Well, to cleanse it. To let your light shine on it. That's what God, what pleases God. That's the mission of Jesus. That's our mission as well. As Christians, little Christs, followers of Christ, imitators of Christ. When we do that, we prove to be children of God. We have to have implanted something in you. Uh, this is a very basic principle in the kingdom of God who is inclusive. He, his will is for all to be saved, to know Him, to enter into life. Let us not give up on anyone. Let us not abandon them, but let us understand, hey, maybe they fail like I do, but the last thing I should do is abandon them. What I should do is help them. Because in the first place, the Spirit of God is within me. 
to heal the brokenhearted, right? To set captives free. People are captives of sin and, and failure. And so we who are strong ought to help the weak. Because sometimes we become weak too and we need their help as well. So we are one. We're one body and Christ is our head who made himself one with us as well. Let us follow after his footsteps. Thank you once again for joining us tonight on the Wednesday evening reflection. God bless you. Have a, a nice uh, next seven days, and actually all the rest of your days, knowing and growing in the knowledge uh, and love of God. We'll see you again next week.